Okay, so before we read Exodus 33, I'm just going to give you a bit of a backstory to um, what's happened to this point. So just before this in Exodus 32, um, Moses um, um, has gone up the mountain and he is, uh, God is giving him commands and he's giving him instructions of how to work with all these people. So obviously the first thing is was get the people out. Okay, so you've got all the people out. Now now everyone's out. Brilliant, everyone's out. And now it's like, oh, now we've got to manage these people. Like they need rules. They need to know what's right and what's wrong. So Moses goes and, and um, spends time with God, and God shows him how it can work well, and, and and what the people should do and what they shouldn't do, and all that kind of stuff. He was gone forty days. In that time, people had got into Aaron's head and convinced him that Moses wasn't coming back. He'd just gone up a mountain, like where they were. And, um, and, they, and so they, they decided, right, we need to make, like, so I love to say that Aaron was, like, really resisting this revolt, okay? But if you read the passage earlier, just before this, it's, it's basically like he says, okay. So they go, like, we should, he's not coming back. We should, he goes, right, okay. Everyone grab your gold, uh, your jewelry, and whatever it is you need, and just bring it, we'll bring it all together, and I'll make a golden calf. Like, it, there's no, he doesn't need convincing. And sometimes we can be in that place too, that actually we feel like we can be strong. Aaron was, was uh, alongside Moses in a lot of things. Mo, Aaron, Aaron was involved in some of the um, plagues that were being um, poured out over Egypt um, without Moses. And, and yet, in this moment, somebody comes to bring doubts into the situation and we can get turned so quickly, can't we? Can we not? So even though we can be laughing at Aaron and think, oh, look at him and turn in so quickly, if we're in the wrong place at the wrong moment, something's happened to us, the whispers can come into our lives in that moment and say, he's not coming back. That's not going to happen. You're never going to amount to anything. Uh, I told you they didn't love you. I told you they didn't like this. Is, this is it. And you're there going like, okay. Yes, that's, yeah, I believe it. And we fall for the lie and we fall for the trap. And quite, quick, quite quickly, we're doing something really stupid. And I put that. Our impatience leads us to making some seriously dumb decisions. Amen? Amen. Yes. Terry, me and you, we've made some dumb decisions. Amen? Yeah. Through impatience. Yeah. Our impatience can make us make some seriously dumb decisions. Okay. Now, three weeks ago, um, who, who loved the last two weeks? We've had, uh, we had Nigel and we had Anne sharing. It was great to have them talking. Yeah. Yeah, cool. More people. Yeah, let's get more people in talking. It's brilliant. Amen. But before that, there was um, an even better speaker, and that was me. And um, now, joke, it's a joke. Um, but f- um, three weeks ago, I shared a message called Stuck in the Illusion. And I don't know if you remember it, it's been a while ago now. But actually, the message was about how um, the illusion was that it looked like um, Satan or the enemy or Pharaoh was winning, but actually he, they'd already lost. And God was setting the trap, not Pharaoh setting the trap. And it was the illusion that we're in sometimes to think, oh no, we're at the end of, we're going to lose this battle. But actually God is setting the trap to defeat the enemy. And um, I don't know if you remember that message, but anyway, what, what had happened in that moment was, um, I remember giving a bit of a story of, of, of how um, Pharaoh would have been so confident of actually chasing them through the sea because right next to that sea was the place of their false god who was the god of the sea, god of the storm. So when he sees a storm, he's walking into a place thinking, well, my god, my false god has got this when he didn't know it was the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that was actually in control at that moment. And so there was this confidence and that's why they followed them in, because it's a really dumb thing to follow them in if you think, like, well, this is their God, probably be a bit dumb to go in there, unless you actually thought, oh, hang on a minute, this is our God. Our God's doing this so that we can get them. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I looked at that and understood that. But what I didn't realize is actually Israel, for a long period of time, had become Egyptified. I made that word up. Okay right on the spot. They became Egyptified. They basically had spent so much time in Egypt, they were probably involved in making the statues and all the things that were going on, all the false gods. They probably knew about the false gods more than they probably knew about their own god because such a period of time had gone on at that time 
that, that actually they would be indoctrinated with Egypt. So, I'm going to kind of reveal something to you just in this little bit here of about what some of the Israelites would have been thinking as they were going through the water as well. So, what happened? Moses goes up the mountain. They've just come through the Red Sea not long after that. It's a bit, a bit of time, but they're not long after. Moses has gone up the mountain. He comes down the mountain, and then they've built this golden calf, this false God. Okay, why? This is, this is, as I was looking at this passage, thinking, okay, why have they done this? Because we're going to look at Exodus 33, but to understand Exodus 33, you just need to know a little bit what's happened before. So why is the golden calf being built? Why a golden calf? Do you know what I mean? Why build like a, a cow, a baby cow? Like, what's the point of it? Like, why not build like something a bit more macho or, you know, like why a, why a cow? Like, why not a lion or why, why not like an elephant or something? I don't know. But... But why the golden calf? So I looked into it. I thought, well, okay, what's the purpose of this? Why, why have they done this? So um, this is just some stuff off of um, encyclopedias and other things. Um, in Egypt, a bull um, was sacred to the god Ta and emblematic of him and the storm god Baal. Baal Zephon, which we learned about three weeks ago, um, is the place um, that they're opposite um, before they go through the Red Sea. And I thought, what's the image of Baal Zephon? Okay. Now, to do this, you've actually got to look at all the other names. There's lots of names that go along with it. And like I said uh, three weeks ago, another name for Baal Zephon is Hadad. And if you look up Hadad, there's a lot more information on that than Baal Zephon. Um, and so this is what it says about Hadad. Hadad is a false god of weather and storms also known as Baal Hadad, the storm god, or often simply Baal. Now this is, I could do another speech on this, but this is why I was thinking, this is why even the story of Elijah is incredible, okay? Because if you think about it, if Baal is actually known as the storm god, and, and they, he's saying, pray to your gods to set fire to this uh, sacrifice, he's, he's going to war with the storm god. Yeah, so it's God that sends the lightning. It's God that sends the lightning that sets fire to the wet thing. But Baal is nowhere to be seen. And I thought about this because he's been defeated at the Red Sea. He had no power. He didn't have any power, but he had power with these people. Yeah, false gods. God could, Satan, can, Satan still can do things today that Jesus can, is what the scripture says. There can still be false prophets out there doing things that look like Jesus. And we know that even in Egypt, they were able to duplicate some of the things that were going on. But God dismissed all that power. So at the Red Sea, Baal the storm god, was dismissed, which makes, means Elijah probably was more confident than you know, because he was like, well, I know that from Scripture that this, this is dealt with. There is no storm god going to set fire to your... Sacrifice, this sacrifice. Now, Baal Zephon or, or Hadad was the sim- is symbolized by the bull. During their exodus from Egypt, the Israelites worshipped a false idol in the shape of a golden calf, and they called it El, the bull. So what we understand here, this is why this passage I'm just about to read from Exodus 32 verse 4 kind of makes sense now. Maybe you did know this, maybe you didn't know this. And so this is um, Aaron, and it says, He received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then he said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land. Does that not make sense? That they were giving glory to Baal, Hadad, whatever name that you want to give him, Because they, just like Pharaoh, some of them when they were going through the sea, were not giving credit to the God, the creator God, the God of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but actually were giving credit to Baal Zephon, who they probably knew more about. And so when they came through the Red Sea, even though God had done that, and we know that God had done it, 
And then they're in the wilderness and they're still complaining and they're still moaning. And then Moses disappears for 40 days. So they go, Moses is clearly dead. He's not coming back. What we need to do is we need to get back to where we were and we need to start building back false idols. These, well, they didn't call them false idols. They didn't know they were building false idols. They believed that this was their deliverer. Which makes this passage make sense when they say, this is your God, little G, so not talking about our God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. That they believed that this calf, a representation, representation of, of Hadad, had actually delivered them through the Red Sea. The calf was a false idol, engraved in the image of a calf, a bull, to give glory to God little God, the little God that they saw that had rescued them from Egypt by parting the sea. What's been amazing for me in studying this is that I didn't know the bit last time we did it, but this bit adds to that because it makes even more sense. It backs it up both ways. Like, oh, we understand that God had to take out this God, and yet we understand why, because he still had power over the Egyptians even after them entering into the wilderness. It's got me thinking, how often do we praise other things for stuff that God does? How much is God getting the glory in our lives? People worship trees for giving them air, but forget it's God that created them. We worship creation over the creator. We thank the universe for the trees or the rain. We give too much credit to humanity. And the strength of humanity. In fact, more so in the last few weeks, I've noticed how powerful um, there is this humanity, false kind of God of humanity is rising up to say it's you and you can and we are and we can. Yeah, and it's this, this thing that I actually think, well, if I'm a created, why am I taking so much glory? Surely I should be giving glory to the one because there's somebody above me. But the reason that we start saying, uh, I am, I am, which is blasphemy in itself. Jesus got killed for saying it, and yet he was the only one who was allowed to say it. Okay? If we start saying it's about us, we are saying there isn't anything above us. There is nothing greater than us. So... Humanity worships humanity, and yet humanity was created by God. This is the world we're in now. People worship the creation. People are trying to save the creation. Do you know there's a lot of that going on at the moment? You know, you probably notice that every Thursday for us, all the recycling you have to do to save the creation, all very good stuff, but how much are we worshiping the creator? How much effort and energy is going in to actually uh, worshipping the creator more so than the creation? How much money are we investing in telling others about the creator? Or is it being invested in keeping hold of God's creation? This is the things that are going on around, right now around the world. How are you living your life? How much glory is God getting? Are you crediting something else or someone else for your deliverance or current situation? Are you seeking glory for helping others instead of pointing to God? It's just a question. It's just a thought. But it's very easy to fall into that trap, just like Aaron did. It didn't take much for him to start fashioning a false idol and giving glory to that idol. And he got to see God use him. Before that, it's not like he was learning to, to, to think, is there a God? He walked with God. He operated with God. God used him to do miracles. He saw incredible things happen. And yet, he was turned. And maybe the reason he's turned is because he started taking his eyes off of God and started putting them on himself or on the people around him. He started giving glory to things. Oh, we, our deliverance is because of something else. Have you ever heard that when, when God, have you ever prayed for anybody? Have you ever maybe had a conversation with someone and they're in need, okay? Someone that doesn't know God, okay? And you're chatting to them and you say, well, pray for that situation. And, and then it turns, yeah, the situation turns. And 
then, instead of them saying, oh, thank you so much for praying, I know that that was God. You know, I might not be ready to follow your God, but I can give all the glory to God. They find all the other reasons of, to give glory to everything else but God, and yet they ask you to pray. So God, who has saved his people, because I always kind of think God is such a gracious God, isn't he? I mean, we love talking about how gracious and how loving God is and how forgiving God is, yeah? Like, he is, he is an amazing God, right? But he's actually a God that gets a bit fuming with us. Do you know that? Because it says here, you know, that actually God was done with them. Can you imagine being a people separated by God? That's us, by the way. We are separated by God, yeah? Imagine being those people and then actually giving all the glory to something else, worshiping something else, spending time with something else. God, regardless of the fact that we want to talk about him being a gracious, loving, incredible, kind, and beautiful God, which he is, all those things, he's also a God that can get jealous. Scripture says that, not me. Do we understand that actually, where is he in our lives? Like, where is God? How big of a deal is he to us? Is he a Sunday thing? Are you here Sunday and then you put God back in his box and you go off and you bring him back out again the following, following Sunday, but only for two hours? And sometimes you get, you get angry because the person like me is taught an extra bit and it was two and a half hours. How dare I have to have two extra bit of God for half an hour, yeah? Gave God two hours. What more does he want? Where is God in our lives? Do you know so many people like me are dictated to by people like you, not you personally, but I'm talking about congregations, yeah? Where you guys would say, oh, could you just talk less? Or could you worship a few songs fewer, please? Or, and, and, and because I've got my dinner in the oven. And so many churches are, are struggling right now because people are fitting bo- God into a box and then people like myself have to create that box to look pretty every Sunday so that people can open that box and play with it and then they can pack it back up and they can go again. And everyone's happy because they've had their two hours of God. But we're talking about the God of the universe, the one that created you, saved you, redeemed you, and set you free. Where is he in your life? How much glory is he getting? How much praise is he getting from you? So God is actually at this point, and I get it, because I've just understood the passage properly, that he parted the Red Sea, probably one of the greatest miracles we're ever going to read about in the Bible. I mean, there's many, but it's one of the, the, one of the biggest, one of the most kind of hit you in the face miracles, God did it. And his people that he was rescuing and delivering gave glory to the God that he defeated by doing it. I don't know why God puts up with us, but he does. Thank God that he is so gracious because we are so dumb. We do some of the strangest things We make some of the weirdest decisions. And sadly, we make it a lot more about ourselves than we do about him. So God is done with them. First, this is it. We're in Exodus 33 now. That was my intro. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, depart and go from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. Lest, basically saying, otherwise I will consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked people. Basically, God is saying, I, you go into the promise I've given you, go. I will send an angel with you, you'll get there. 
And I will even help you defeat the things that you need to defeat there. But I ain't going. Because if I do, I'm going to get a bit mad and you ain't going to make it. Oh, I love the God that's so gracious and loving and kind. Don't you? <laughs> Let's only preach that, Rich. Get back on track. Let's just talk about that God. Do you know when people say that there's a God in the Old Testament and a God in the New Testament? Yeah, punch them in the face if they ever say that to you again. Spiritually. <laughs> Dumbest comment anyone could ever make. How can God be the beginning and the end of everything, and yet he decided to change halfway through? The God that we read about here is the same God that is hanging on the cross. It's the same God that blinds Paul. It's the same God that allows Stephen to be stoned. We, we read the Old Testament like, oh, I don't want to read that too much because he's a bit angry a lot of the time. Well, when you hang out with Israel, you understand why. But actually, it's the realization that this is the character of God, and he's a father to us, which means that he loves us so much that he will rescue you from your own pit and sometimes he might even discipline you so you don't end up going down the same route. Yes, that's God. Maybe people didn't preach this enough. But this is the same God. If the same God is like this here, he's the same God today. Can you imagine being a person that discourages God so much because he pours out so much blessing on you, and yet you divert all that blessing to something else. Can you imagine how that makes God feel? And we do. We do. And then we wonder why, where's God? God says, go, go, you will go to the promised land, but I will not go with you. You are a stiff-necked which means to be stubborn, cruel, hard, obstinate, which actually means to refuse to change. You want to know why God isn't in a lot of churches today? Because they refuse to change. And not refuse to give in to the word or do something different or align ourselves with the 21st century. They refuse to move with God. They're stiff-necked people. The cost of refusing to change is being seen within Christianity more today than ever. People want Jesus, but they don't want change. People want to be saved, but they don't want to change. Yeah? I do. Do you know what I mean? I want the benefits. Yeah? I, want the ben I don't want to go through this. I don't want Why is he bothering me with stuff, you know? I thought this Jesus, he saved me, and I get the benefits of that saving. And God's like, no, we're going to change on the way. Oh, I didn't sign up for that. I just signed up for the, the eternal life thing. Yeah, it's, I didn't want the extra package, you know? Everyone wants to be saved. Everyone wants the benefit of Christ. But no one actually wants to know him. And that's why he died. He didn't die just to save you from, eternity, from your eternal damnation. He died so you can have a relationship with the Father. In fact... That's the story throughout Scripture, that God created us to have fellowship with him. We broke it. God tried to fix it. We broke that. So then he sends Jesus. Jesus fixed it, even though we broke him. Yeah? It's all about presence. It's all about being in his presence, being with him. We have to be a people who, when we look back, we see we are not people with what we once were. Yeah? That our lives point more to Jesus today than they ever have. And if that's not the case, don't be condemned. Just change. Yeah? If your life doesn't point more to Jesus than it did, at some other point, something's gone wrong. Yeah? So change. Don't be stiff-necked. Change. Adjust to what's happened. Move with God 
so that you can actually be in the promises he has for you. That's a scary challenge. Because when are we ever feeling like, man, I feel I had good days. I had some good old days. I had some amazing times with God. But we should be more in love with Jesus today than we ever have been. Do you know why? Because you invested in that relationship and you fall more in love with him. I love my wife more today than I did the day we met. Love you. (laughs) Yeah, we... But because actually I've got to know her more. We've got to spend more time together. We've got to build a relationship. We've gone through some really tough stuff together and come out the other side of it and we're stronger for it. That's the same with my relationship with Jesus. The more time I spend with him, the more I get to know him, the more I read about him, the more I fall in love with him. Has anyone ever read the Bible? Yeah? Anyone? (laughs) Anyone read the Bible? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, cool. Yeah, and when you read the Bible, yeah, and you read about Jesus and you read it properly, you go, man... I think I love him even more than I did before I started reading this because he's just incredible. So we should be more in love with Jesus now. And we should be be showing off Jesus in our lives more than we ever have. If you're stiff-necked, just change. Verse 4. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. That offended them. They were offended by being called stiff-necked because they didn't want to change, but they were offended by it. So they took off their jewelry. Okay? I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. This is what he said to them. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know that you, what you to do to you. <laughs> so the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Now, this is interesting. Ornaments, basically jewelry. Um, it was these ornaments, or obviously not these ones, but ornaments like this that were used to create the golden calf. Okay? So they were wearing their gold, and they, um, Aaron says, take off all your gold. And I'll create a golden calf with it. And so they take off their ornaments. Obviously, they must add some more because they plundered Egypt. So they put some more on, whatever. And God says, you take that off right now to see, so you can show me that you're where you're at. Let's see who you're worshiping. Let's see what's going on here. So they strip themselves of their ornaments. But if you read ahead, which we're not going to do, but you can do this as homework. If you read Exodus 25, you will read that they took these similar ornaments and they brought them to to be offerings for the new tabernacle, which is the place where the presence of God dwells. So, does anyone know like super strict Christians or has known? Don't look at them in the eye if they're here. Okay. Okay, right, okay. You know when people like super strict Christians are like, you can't touch that, don't look at it, don't do anything, you know all that kind of stuff, yeah? Yeah, those kind of people? Yeah. Now, there are some things you don't go near, definitely. But in some cases, like jewelry, jewelry is not the problem. It's what you do with it, that is, yeah? I'm not getting into Leviticus or anything like this. But what I'm saying is, in this instance, jewelry was made to create a false idol, but a couple of chapters further, jewelry was used to be brought into the offering, as an offering towards the construction of the tabernacle. You see, sometimes we can be so focused on something being so evil that it's not actually that thing that's evil. It's what you've now used it for that has made the evil or created the bad thing. This is why God says a love of money, not money itself. Money can be used to do incredible things. Change lives, build stuff. People are building villages around the world through charitable giving to help people live in better situations. Money is not the problem. It's what you do with it that is. It's what you make of it. So if you create it to be an idol, then it becomes a problem that God has to deal with. If you manage it the way God teaches us to manage it, it can be a beautiful thing and a life-changing thing, not just for you but for others. Jewelry, jewelry isn't evil, 
in this instance. It's just what it was used for that was. What are your ornaments today? I don't wear jewelry. Yeah? Hopefully that was Guy saying that. Yeah? But I don't wear jewelry. Okay. What about the ornament of time? Yeah? What, what do you do with your time? Because time can be used for good, but it can also be used in a way that can create you to do some bad things. Too much time on our hands can create us to make some bad decisions, yeah? So maybe time is one of your ornaments. Money, as I said a minute ago, can be one. What about your eyes? Your eyes can be ornaments. They're not evil. Your eyes aren't evil. But what you um, allow them to see can. And then what that sees goes in here. And then what goes in here can then become an action. So how's your ornament of your eyes or your ears? What you hear can impact you and affect you. Your ears are not evil. But if you subject them to evil things, to hearing things that they shouldn't be hearing, then they will get in here. And they will create something that goes on in here that will become an action. Sin. The mind, what are we subjecting the mind to? It's a really important lesson because we can sit here and say, oh, you don't know my life. You don't know how difficult it is. You don't know what I go through. You don't know things I face. But the reality of it is, is that if we just actually invested our time, money, eyes, ears, and mind on him, we wouldn't be moaning about the things that we're struggling and battling with. We would be overcomers. We would be dealing with things differently. We would know where we need to be. We would know that we can heal. We would know that actually this is a a season right now, but God is with me because I'm in his presence. I'm with him right now. How are your ornaments doing? What are you using them for? Verse 7. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called in the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out of the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. Sometimes to get to the place where you will benefit the most from God, you will need to remove yourself from the camp. The distractions, the noise, the discouragements, the place where you can be, where you can procrastinate, which means to become idle. See what I did there? Yeah? You can create an idol by doing nothing. Yeah? Who is the loudest voice in your life? What or who is the biggest influencer in your life? If it ain't God or it ain't pointing to him, then perhaps you need to come out of that camp so you can be in his presence. Are the people closest to you pointing you to Jesus? Are the people involved... Um, you involve yourself with, are they pointing you to God? Are people telling you what's best for you to align you with your, align you with God? Are you around those people or is the voices in your life of people telling you, you don't need Jesus, you don't need God, you don't need to go to church this week, skip it, it's all right. You don't need fellowship. You don't need to pray. You don't need to worship God. What kind of people are in your life? And if there are people in your life, maybe you need to leave the camp. Verse 8. So it was, whenever Moses went out of the tabernacle, that all the people rose, and each man stood at the tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose and worshipped each man in his tent door. Question. Do you want to be a person who watches others enjoy the presence of God? Brilliant. Okay. There was a question. Do you want to be someone who watches someone else enjoying the presence of God? 
Actually, that's a good question. That's a good answer. We do want to see other people enjoying the presence of God. But whilst you're not, I'll add that little bit. <laughs> well done, Donna. <laughs> that's good. It's a good answer. Do you want to watch other people enjoy the presence of God while you're not? We don't want to be spectators in this relationship with God. I thank God that we no longer have to watch people enjoy God on our behalf. Yeah? We don't need priests. We don't need middlemen. We don't need to watch someone else find out stuff so we can be like, what did he say to me today? That we have this incredible relationship with the creator God through Jesus Christ that we can actually have a conversation with him and he can talk to us directly. No one needs to be a spectator anymore. No one needs to build people like myself up as being the answer for how they get their messages and their information and what God is saying. They can go straight to the source, directly to him. And yet, how many Christians are spectators today? How many people are turning up every Sunday to receive what is going on on the stage and then and take and then say, right, I hope they do a better job next week. Yeah? I hope it's somebody else that speaks. Oh, I hope they have the different worship team. I like their worship. We are not meant to be spectators in our faith. <laughs> you know, like, um, we're on Google because we have, to, we have um, like email and stuff like that, so we're signed up to it. But what it means is that we have to have Google reviews, okay? So people can give reviews of church, and it makes me laugh. Because people are like, oh, I can give you a review. And I'm like, why would I want you to give me a review? It's not a restaurant. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's like, a, like what, what, is, what is wrong with the world now that Christians think they could go to a church and say, I'll give a review? I don't understand it. But that's the world we're in. People that want to be spectators. People that can write on a keyboard and no one even knows their, what their face looks like. It's a bit creepy, actually. Don't be a spectator. You have every opportunity to be involved in the kingdom of God. Do you know that? And do you want to know the only person stopping you? Yep, you. What's that? You. It's just you. Mark is stopping all of you. <laughs> Pitchforks. <laughs> yes, you. It's just us. Always us. We stop ourselves. We talk ourselves out of it. We look low down about ourselves. Or we, we do weird things that make it really hard to actually let God use us. Start entering into his presence. Verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. The title of the message today is Be Intent on Staying. I've never read this passage before acknowledging that Joshua is in it. When we read through, through 32, 33, 34, it's all about the presence of God. Basically, Moses goes up the mountain, comes down the mountain. He's with God. They create a false idol. Then God says, I'm going to remove my presence from you. Moses goes, please don't remove your presence from us. Please. Then he creates a tabernacle about getting, having the presence of God. So Moses' tent is the place where God dwells, and Moses hangs out there. And everyone else has to be a spectator. They all look out of their tent going, oh, look at Moses spending time with God. Yeah? That's how it looks. So it's all about the presence of God. And then after this, he goes back up the mountain to redo that which they destroyed. Okay? And then he comes back. Back down the mountain and he's glowing because he's been in the presence of God. And in between that, he says, I want to see your glory. And God says, I'll let you look out of the corner of your eye because if you look at me, you drop dead. Okay, so it's all about the presence of God. And yet, because of that, we miss this tiny little verse that Joshua does not depart the tabernacle. Moses is the story, the, the, the character of this story. This is the one we're reading about. But it's Joshua that does not depart the tabernacle. There's nothing wrong with Moses departing. He's, he's, he's glowing with the Lord. He's walking with the Lord. He's doing what he's doing. But Joshua, he's not stood outside of his tent looking at what's going on. 
He's hanging out at the tabernacle. Moses called by God, he walks into Egypt, and God leads the people to freedom through miracles that God does through Moses, okay? So Joshua sees Moses and makes the decision, okay, I want to be doing what this guy's doing. Not, I want to be the leader, I just want to be in a relationship with God like he is in a relationship with God. How do I do that? How, how does this work? So the first opportunity he gets to understand that the presence of God is going to fall in the tabernacle and God is going to converse with Moses directly, he stays there. He goes there and he sits there and he does not depart. He's intent. He is in the tent, but he's intent on staying. He's intent. He's deliberate in staying. He he makes a point to stay. He is he goes for it, and he says, I'm going to do this. He makes, he makes it his, his sole purpose is to be in the presence of God. So Joshua stays. Joshua goes on to be one of the few that say that they can go into the land because of the promised land and possess it, yeah? Why? Because he was in God's presence. Do you, do you understand about faith? Yeah? Now, if God is doing something in your life, or you're in conversa- conversation with him, or you're, you're getting into his word, or you're just having fellowship in prayer with him, or you're just in this place of worship with God, you can come out of those moments knowing more about your purpose than you would if you went, I don't know what to do with my life. Okay, God. And then you go out and you step out and you just don't know. Why? Because you didn't invest in the relationship. Joshua did. Joshua invested in the relationship. And because he invested in the relationship, it meant that he had the faith to be able to not see that the promised land was an impossible thing to overcome. He just said, well, I hang out with God and he's pretty big. I think he can do this. We can take this land. It comes because he was intent on staying. He chose to stay where he should stay. He chose to remain in the place that he should. Everyone else is a spectator. Everyone else is just watching. But Joshua says, I need to be here. This is exactly where I need to be. So that when it came to going into the promised land, he's able to say, we can do this. Joshua deliberately stayed. He hung in the presence of God. And in doing so, belief and faith grew so much that he did not see the obstacles. He did not see giants. He did not see fear. He did not see defeat. He knew that with God, Anything was possible. And he knew this because he was intent on staying. People today, Christians today, they want everything now. Who wants it now? Yeah? Who wants their bank account filled up with money right now? Yeah? It's all right. You can be honest. Yeah? Just me. Wow. You guys are amazing. You're so spiritual. Wow. Okay. Well, if you don't want it, God, they don't want it. There should be plenty. Just put it in mind. Okay. Thank you. You know, who wants that? Who wants a nicer car because the one that you got, you don't know if it's even going to get you to work, yeah? You know, who wants it now? Who wants to get home and have their dinner now? Like, who wants to, to be able to be like, oh, actually, let's go to the drive through and get our food now. Like, let's just do it now. Everything can be now. Every, the world is creating a now world. You want to know what's going on on the news? You don't have to wait till 8 o'clock anymore to watch the news. You could just go on your phone and be like, oh, that's what's going on in the world right now. Everything is now. Everything is, what, how do we get it? Right now. We can have it now. But the problem with that way of thinking is it's not how God works. It's just not how God works. God is not an instant God. He's not a God that's just going to turn up and, like a genie and say, yes, what is your wish for today? And I will grant it. It comes through investment, through relationship, and through time. You want to get to somewhere with God? You know, invest in the relationship so he can put the promises and the faith and all the tools you need so that when you go into the promises, you're like, because promises look like this, don't they? We think, oh, God's going to promise me a child, yeah? Just say maybe someone's like, I feel like God's going to promise me a child, yeah? Monica's here, is she here? Yeah, you had that promise, yeah? God's going to promise me a child. But when you get that child, you're like, why does this thing not shut up, yeah? Yeah? So, so the, the, the truth of it is, is that actually the promised land was amazing, but it actually also had the enemy in it. It also had difficult things going on in it. 
So the reality of it and the understanding of it is that actually promises are good, but they still have obstacles, yeah? So if we're not intent on staying with the Lord in the times that we're meant to be staying with the Lord, then we are going to walk into those promises completely unready and, 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 and completely out of our depth so that when it comes, we're like, I don't know what to do. And God's like, because you didn't stay with me, I, had, I could have put everything you needed in you to help you with what you were going to do next. And I don't know whether it's church, but there is doctrines out there that say, the promises of God, the promises of God, you need to just give me some money and I'll, you get the promises of God. I don't know. You know, like, but the promises of God, they're on their way. They've got, it looks like this. It's amazing. It's, it's flowing with milk and honey. But it also says that he has to deal with the Jebusites and the other heights. You know, there's an enemy in there. And we've got to change. If we think that it's all about it all working out and it's all looking good and it's all just perfect, then we're going to miss the fact that we're in the promise. Because we can be in the promise and it can be amazing, and yet we're missing that we're actually, oh my gosh, we're in the land that God promised us because we're so focused on the walls of Jericho. And that's part of the promise. God, couldn't you wipe them all out before we got here? God's like, no, because I've equipped you. What's amazing is they go through the Red Sea. Joshua goes parts, they go through in a similar fashion through the Jordan. Because they were prepped. They went through it with God. So they could go through it in the future. And I bet you, I didn't even think about this. Wow. That's cool. So the Red Sea... Part in the Red Sea, actually over a few days or whatever it would be, the glory actually goes to Baal. But actually, 40 years later, the Jordan, they part, this, the, they go through the Jordan and they give glory to God. And he says, this building memorial stones to remember where we come from. Do you see what God can, that's so cool. Man, that would have been so good in the preach. Okay. Yeah, it is, but as a preach. Okay. So, isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that actually we are so focused, oh my gosh, 40 years in the wilderness. If you didn't have that with God, how could you do this? We have to be intent on staying where God wants us to be so that we can actually do the things that we think that we want to do and we want to be in. But we have to do this first. We have to be intent on staying. His presence is where it all starts. Are you a person that prays for God to do, to perform, to provide, to give? Do you ask him with a bit of impatience? Are you treating God like he's meant to be doing it your way and at your mercy and at your command? Or do you want to be a person who can walk into the promises of God because you decided to invest in his presence and grow and know that he is the Lord your God, not your genie? We need to become a people, a church that isn't trying to measure our success on how much is happening, but actually know that we will see the promises, not because what we are doing of what we are doing, but because of the time we are willing to invest in just being with him. We need to become a people who are intent on staying. Joshua goes on to become the one who leads the Israelites out of the wilderness and into the promises. And it is all because of this simple line of scripture that we all miss. But his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. You went, you want to see God move in your life, your family, your business, your relationships, your future. You want God to use you, then be intent. Be deliberate in making time for God. Be deliberate in being in his presence. I'm not just talking about, we have a relationship with God. You drive in the car, you have a relationship with God. I'm talking about just sitting in his presence and not saying a word, just sitting with him and saying, God, me and you. Just do that. Because we can run around doing things in the name of Jesus. We have busy lives. We've got to visit family. We've got to go to work. We've got to look after children. But actually, what is the point of all of that if the creator God doesn't get any of your time? And they're fitting him in to just your journeys as you drive. Those things are great. You have a relationship with God. I, I, I do the same. 
I go on walks, I talk to God. I'm talking about being intent in just being in his presence with no angle, no timetable, just you and him. If you do this, and this is the reason I'm bringing this message, this is a challenge for me. If you do this, your life will be different. Jesus died so that we can have access to the presence of God. We cannot take that for granted or let it just be words. We need to become a people who honor that sacrifice by being deliberate with our time in God's presence. We can't just say Jesus died for me so that I could have access to the Father. We can't just say the words. We need to be deliberate in actually taking God up on that offer. He's given you access to the Father. So so the story goes like this, doesn't it? He creates us to have fellowship. God is in fellowship with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sin and break it. From that moment onwards, there's a barrier between us and the Father. Okay? We can't access him. There's nothing we can do. God puts in a system that enables us to have a a, a version of it, but it's not the same. And And it has a lot of commands involved in it as well. And then Jesus comes along. And he doesn't just come along, wave a magic wand, and say, I repair it in Jesus' name. He dies. He has to die. He has to be beaten, and he has to be spat at and ridiculed, and he has to be deserted by those that were closest to him, and then he has to be nailed to a cross so that you can have access to the presence of God. And we've got to be deliberate in taking him up. We have to be intent and saying, oh, God, do you know what? I'm not even remotely giving you that amount of glory that I should for what you went through. I need to be in your presence more. It benefits me. But also, I should do it because it's why you died. So when people come around and they're, and, we're, and we're, all of us can be like, I'm tired, I'm worn out, I haven't got, you're like, how much time are you spending with God? Forget what people are doing, forget how your life looks. You can't take anything of that with you. How much time are you spending with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? How much are you doing a Joshua and just sitting in his presence? Because Joshua got active, you read it. Joshua did things in God's name, but he was able to do it because he sat and stayed. And Moses says, doesn't he, we don't want to go anywhere without you. You don't want to go, I think I'm going to say that in a minute, but he doesn't want, we don't want to go anywhere without you. We don't want to go where you're not going. So it's not that we're not moving, but when God is staying, are we staying? When God is saying, slow down right now. Are we actually slowing down? Be like, no, Lord, I've got to do this because I don't know if I'm going to look like a Christian otherwise. God's like, just slow down. I want to spend time with you. Moses does say this in 12. He says, Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you have now, you've also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know that you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight? Except you, except that you will go with us. We will be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. This is a huge statement. What separates you from the person that doesn't know Jesus? What separates you? What makes you different? What makes people look at you and go, they're different? Hopefully they do. And if they don't, why not? The difference between us and the rest of the world is the presence of God. You're just as much of a sinner. You might even be more screwed up than some of them are. 
She's not here. The difference between you and the world is what Moses is saying. If you're not with us, what is going to separate us from them? You are the only thing that makes us different. Your presence with us is the only thing that makes me different from my relative that doesn't know you or my work colleague that doesn't know you or the neighbor. Your presence. Therefore, we should be investing in his presence more than ever. Surely. Because the world is getting clouded. Christianity is definitely getting clouded. And people need to see the difference between someone saying they're a Christian and someone actually being a Christian. That might be on you. Maybe you're the one person that if you do this with God, shines a light in some of the darkest areas so that people that were confused by all the options that were going on would say, no, that person is different. And you can say, it's because I have the presence of God. God himself, same power, that rose Jesus from the grave, lives in you. The presence of God. That's why you're different. Therefore, how much are you investing in that presence? How much are we acknowledging what Jesus did on the cross so that we can even have that? How many times do we go where we want to, yeah, make our own decisions, And then ask God why he has left us in this mess. Yeah? You can put your hand up, actually. Let's do that. Just make me feel better. Okay. (laughs) You go and do something completely off your own back. And then you're like, Lord, why are you not with me? And God's like, I can't go with you. Like, I can't be with you in this. You're in this mess that you've created. And even though I'm a gracious God that will pluck you out of that mess, because he will over and over again, maybe it's time that we start changing the way that we think. Sorry, I know it's out of camera angle, sorry. I try and keep it in. Okay. <laughs> if, if we put ourselves in a position where we run ahead, then we are... We, What I'm trying to say here is we need to grow up. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I think actually what I'm trying to say is that we need to start maturing in our faith. If you've only been saved like three weeks, Donna, grow up, okay? Do you know what I mean? I'm only joking. Okay. If you've been saved a few weeks, you're cool. But if you've been in your faith a while, it's time to grow up. We've got to stop putting ourselves in stupid positions, expecting God to pull us out because he will, because he's amazing, and actually just grow up. Like, actually, we will put ourselves in less of those messes if we just stay in his presence, if we actually just don't move, if we just stay where we're meant to stay and be with him, then we'll end up in the promise. So as Christians, we need to stop It's not that we are capable of it. We're still going to mess up, okay? But we need to grow up and start becoming more mature in the way that we understand. If I invest in my relationship with God, I'm going to have a lot less mess for him to clean up. And as Christians, I think maybe if we built an expectation... Oh, it doesn't matter if this is God or not because he'll still save me. He'll still rescue me. Maybe we've got lethargic about it. Maybe we've got into a place where we just think, well, God's still going to rescue me. If I sin, he can still say sorry in the morning and then it all will be okay. But how about we just, knowing that that grace exists, how about we just don't take the liberty of it and we actually honor God with our lives and just say, actually, I'm going to spend time with the creator. I'm not going to moan about my life and t- if I haven't actually spent time with the creator that can give me the answers about it. People might knock on our doors as a church, as pastors, whatever, and be like, oh, life sucks. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in your life right now? That's why no one comes to speak to me anymore. 
But where's Jesus? If Jesus is where he's meant to be, then we've got to look at whether there's a reason for this and we can pray into it. But if Jesus isn't there, what can I do? Like if you haven't given Jesus every opportunity to, 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 to deal with your situation, what can a man do? What can a person do? So if you're not intent in being in his presence, if you're not going to make it a deliberate act of your relationship and your walk with God, then we're going to end up in a mess that God has to get a crane to get us out every time. And we're like, oh, he's so gracious. He's so loving God. He's such a good God. But God's like, we're going in circles here when the promise is over there. We, we could have been there ages ago. It's not for us to keep running into a mess and expect God to bail us out because he can. We need to grow up in our faith and, people, and become people who will refuse to go anywhere God is not going. I'm not saying we ain't sinning. We sang sin this morning. But the reality of it is, is that actually the truth is, how about we try not to? How about we try more to align ourselves with God than just accepting, well, this is just my life. This is the way my flesh is. This is the way it works. How about we just become a people that when we're in his presence and the more we're in his presence, the less the other stuff has got any attraction. That we refuse to go anywhere God is not going. So that next job you apply for, that next relationship you're seeking, that career you're looking into, maybe even a new house or changing of destination. If you're just making the decisions because it's like, I really like that job. Well, is it where God wants you? Because it ain't going to work if God isn't going with you. If God is with you in it, it's going to be awesome. And not necessarily easy, but you'll see God's purposes in it. Or the relationship that you're seeking with somebody. If it's one with God leading the way, then God will align you with the person that you're meant to be with. Or you can have a hundred relationships with loads of people and never ever feel complete. Or the career that maybe parents are put on you. This is what you should do. Is it what God wants? Go to university. Is that what God wants? Stop telling your kids to do what you think they should do. Ask God what you think God wants best for your kids. Have you ever thought of that? Yeah? Are we asking God what he wants for our kids or are we telling our kids what we want or think they should do based on what we didn't do or did do or we were told to do and didn't do? Yeah? What's that got to do with them? How about we become a people who, that, who don't need God to bail us out of our mess because we chose to be where he was instead? In Deuteronomy 31, just finishing now. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate, inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Then the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in the pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. Therefore Moses wrote this song the same day and taught, taught it to the children of Israel. Then he inaugurated, which means he inducted him as the leader. Joshua, the son of Nun. And said, be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. And then this is Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, and you and all these people to the land that I'm giving them, and the, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give to you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea towards going down to the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Can you imagine that? You see what God did with Moses? I will not leave you nor forsake you. 
Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night and you, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be good, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua goes on to lead them through the Jordan River, around the walls of Jericho, and he even got to pray for the sun to stand still. Why? Because he was intent on being in the presence of God. If you want to know what you need to equip you for the future, you've already got it. Get into his presence. Seek his face. Turn from the things you need to turn away from. Humble yourself. Lower yourself. No more I am, but he is. Yeah? Make it about him, everything about him. Live a life for him. He had made a decision to choose to dwell in the house of God rather than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Scripture says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Isn't that incredible? I don't even know if that's written for Joshua, but that's literally what Joshua did. The people that were wicked were stood in their tents, but Joshua sat in the house of God. The reason I want to share this story with you, and the reason you may think it's a bit harsh, is I just really believe God is asking us to go deeper with him. I believe he's challenging me to go deeper with him. In fact, recently I got to a point where I was a bit like, I was running around, there's lots of things that were going on um, over the last couple of months, and, and it's all, you know, all part of being a family of God, but actually I was losing a little bit of my connection with God, so even though I'm turning up to all these different things that I need to do in the name of God, I'm like, I feel a little bit like I'm not actually spending time with the one I'm talking about. And we can't get to that place where we just accept that that's okay now because we're busy. It's not okay. It's not okay to just to be in that place where someone like me or someone like you that might chat to anyone on the street about God or your neighbors or your family, if you're talking about him, because we can talk him up, can't we? I mean, we could talk Jesus up. It's easy because it writes itself like it's an incredible story. But there's a difference between talking about the one that saved you, created you, redeemed you, and knowing him. We can talk about Jesus, but do we know him? Do we know God? And this isn't just like, oh, yeah, I know him. I met him last week, and and we're doing great. It's this investment that we continue to have. My relationship with Claire will die if we don't have a relationship with one another and spend time with each other and speak to each other. It's the same with God. It's like if we just, we could do all the things in the world to be busy in Jesus' name and not know him or lose touch with him. And there's nothing worse, isn't there? To be in that place of like, oh, wow. Am I actually spending time with the very one I'm telling all of you guys to spend time with, hence this message? So it's just a challenge that I know is over my life, but I think it's over us as a church that actually we do need to grow up a bit. And if you've been saved a few months, I'm not, it's, you carry on. But what I'm saying is actually choose his presence more. Seek his face more. And in doing so, you have all the tools you need for the things that you have to battle 
instead of fighting them yourself, wondering why you don't have the tools to win. Well, where's God? And in being able to spend just a little bit of time with God this week, just giving him more than I was, you know the difference. I feel the difference. I understand the difference. So why would I not want to be in that more? Why would I not want to hang in that place more? Sometimes I have a lot more time on my hands than some of you probably think. But I can procrastinate or I can fill it with just junk. Why? What is that going to do for me? And I want to challenge you the same. Are you making space for the presence of God? Are you running on ahead or are you going to choose to stay? Are you going to be intent, deliberate, and staying where God is and only moving when he says move?